Hi everyone. So <clears throat> we are still in the discussion of first chapter from from the same book Theory of Machine and Mechanism by Shigley. As I said, I'm using <clears throat> fifth edition, so uh, fifth or fourth, both are similar things. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> we are discussing uh, the different kinds of mechanisms as discussed last in last lecture. Uh, there the classification or character six of mechanism to classify those is not an easy task. Uh, why it is so difficult because of the the nature of different level of mechanisms and the working principles, uh, different varieties. So the current discussion is based on one of the paper by published by Professor uh, and uh, we are discussing the classifications regarding that. All right, so uh, there were some mechanism like snap action, uh, linear actuators uh, that what we discussed last time. Uh, there was a fine adjustment, uh, which is basically a lead screw uh, and is called as a differential screw as well, where you have such combination where uh, two different nature of screws are, are being attached. So if you move one component, the second will have a relatively different movement depending upon the leads of both screws. Then there was a clamping mechanism. Uh, what we discussed. Uh, so the clamping mechanism is bas basically uh, is kind of a to true toggle mechanism, basically. Yeah, so typically clamping mechanism are the C clamp, the woodworks screw clamp, cam actuated and lever actuated clamp. So this is one of the lever actuated clamp where you apply uh, forces through this lever. So this is this is similar uh, to, to to another category to toggle mechanism, which is can, which can be classified as a clamping mechanism as well. Uh, so the next one is basically. Uh, locational drive. Uh, uh, locational device. So Trofferson shows 15 different locational mechanism. They are usually self-centering and locate either axially or angular, angularly using springs and tetons. Uh, so uh, you can consult the same paper where 15 different locational mechanisms are being explained over there. Uh, but in the, in the in the in the book we are discussing, there was no visual uh, any of any of those one. So we'll just just go through it actually. Uh, so the next is basically a category where which is called as a ratchets and escape pins. Uh, such category. So there are many different forms of ratchets and escape pins. Some quite quite clever. So. They, they they are relatively simple mechanisms, but they are doing quite clever functions. So they are used in locks, jacks, clockwork and other applications requiring some form of intermittent motion. So in all these category, ratchets and escapements, the most important thing is about intermittent motion. So there is a movement and uh, but it is not really a continuous motion basically. Uh, figure 1.12, so this is still same one chapter, shows four typical applications. So one by one we'll discuss. The ratchet in figure 1.12a allows only one direction of rotation of wheel two. So this is this is the wheel two. So this rotates just in one direction, which is this one. 
you can you can imagine if it wants to return back. So this this three link will not allow it to rotate back. So Paul three, which is which is being this 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 lever is held against the wheel by gravity or by spring. It, it could be both. Uh, a sim similar arrangement is used for lifting jacks, which then employ a tooth rack for a linear motion. So there are still some other variations of similar mechanism, uh, but the sole purpose is just to allow only one direction movement. So it is it, it, it is anti-clockwise at the minute, uh, but if it wants to rotate clockwise, it will not be allowed by this link three. All right, so in continuation of uh, others. Yeah, so now another one example after that 11.12B is basically for rotary adjustment. So it is, it is also similar phenomena where you have uh, link three, which is also allowing one direction movement. So it, it allows to move this direction movement. You can imagine, but if it's going to be this direction, so it will not allow. So this is for the rotary adjustment uh, type of uh, mechanism, basically. Uh, now another category. So anchor three. So this 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 is being called, uh, called as anchor three here, this link. Uh, drives a pendulum whose oscillating motion is caused by the two clicks engaging wheel two. So this is basically oscillating because of rotation of this one. So when you, you can imagine, so it's being pushed downward, this one. So when it's, it's pushed downward, so it will rotate in this direction basically. So when it rotates, so it will cause the oscillation of this three link basically. So one push, one is a push click and another is pull click. Yeah. So basically one is this one is when it's moving downward. So it is pushing. Yeah. And this one is basically pulling up. Right. So that's why it's, it's saying one push click and other is pull click. The lifting and engaging of each click caused by oscillation of pendulum it results in a wheel motion that at the same time presses each respective click and adds a gentle force to the motion of the pendulum. So this is this is like the way it, it, it works basically. <coughs> uh, the next one is also category of ratchet and escapements. So the escapement is shown in figure 1.12D. So this is the G part. Uh, has a control wheel too. So this is the control wheel, this one. Uh, that may rotate continuously to allow wheel three to be driven by another source. So you can just imagine when it's rotating, for example, uh, it's, it's rotating. So it or every time it passes through uh, one of these holes, for example, which is being this this just being rotated separately. So. So there are there are uh, two sources, one source for this one, one source for this one. So of course, the, uh, once we have a clear picture of what is what is the input and what kind of output is required, then these these mechanisms are are in a better viewpoint of view actually. Uh, but here the purpose was to show you how different kinds of mechanisms are are basically available. Okay, the next category uh, which is listed in the book is indexing mechanism. So the indexer shown in figure 1.13a, so this is one, uh, this is part A, uses standard gear teeth. So this is like gear teeth, standard gear teeth. Uh, for light loads, pins can be used in the input wheel too. So the input wheel two a pin can be employed here with a corresponding slot in the wheel three, but 
neither form should be used if the shaft inertias are large. So basically, uh, what he's saying is this is for light loaded applications. So you can imagine if, if let's say this is being rotated in this direction. So you you have some rotation of this direction of this wheel basically, and then you have the teeth which are kind of like matching with the uh, with the meshed teeth basically. So it has uh, regular movement, and uh, the next one is is shows a Geneva wheel, sometimes called as a Maltese cross indexer. So these are more. There are there are more slots may be used in the driven link two. So this is you see this is the link two. Uh, basically, it, it, it also includes partly this one as well. So more slots can be added in this one, which can be attached to or greater to the output to be indexed. High speeds and large inertias may cause problem with this indexer. So basically, uh, this is also for a smaller uh, nature, basically. So it is it is uh, small loads application. So it's not really large load, basically. So we keep going. So the next one is also a part of indexing mechanism. So toothless ratchet five. So this is toothless ratchet. So it's like circular disc. So there is no tooth on it. Uh, is driven by oscillating crank two. So this is oscillating crank two. So the way it says, so most probably is oscillating like this up and down. So when it's up and down, so basically it, it can move in, in, in either direction, basically. So Professor lists nine different indexing mechanisms and may many variations are possible. So within that research paper uh, or classification, uh, there are further nine different uh, uh, categories are being explained as well. Uh, but it really, really depends. So very few are being discussed here actually. All right, so the next is swinging or rocking mechanism. Right, so the category of swinging or rocking mechanism is often termed oscillator. So these are called as a oscillator as well. So in each case, the output rocks or swings through an angle that is generally less than 360 degree. So the, the, the component which is swinging is normally less than 360. What does it mean? It is not going to rotate a complete revolution. So it will be less than 360. However, the output shaft can be geared to the to a successor shaft to produce a large angle of oscillation. So nevertheless, if the angle here is less, but this can further be changed by using some gears application, uh, which is possible. So you can you can increase the angle of rotation more than, uh, let's say if it was 50 degree of uh, swing, you can convert 50 to 100, for example, by applying some gears. So now there are a couple of more examples for so swinging and rocking mechanism, which is basically oscillator. So figure 1.14a is a mechanism consisting of a rotating crank. So this is the rotating crank. So it is rotating like this basically. So it could be clockwise or anti-clockwise to a coupler. So this point, this, this part is a coupler basically uh, containing a rack. So this coupler has a rack here. So this is a rack which meshes with the output gear four. So this one is meshing with this gear basically, right? So meshing means it has teeth and this has teeth as well uh, to produce oscillating motion. Now you can imagine if if let's say this is being oscillated, this is being rotated, this, this crank. So this one will just do to and fro motion oscillation and which will cause this four link to move 
for example, half circle, for example, it moves from this. So if let's say you mark some point here, so this point will come from here to this end and to back to this end. So basically it is oscillating. So that's why it's called as the oscillator as well. Or you call it as a swinging or rocking mechanism too, basically. All right. So, <clears throat> so in figure 1.14b, so this is the B, crack 2 drives link 3. So crack 2, so you just imagine this crack is basically is doing 360 degree rotation. If so, if it's rotating, this will also rotate, right? Uh, sorry, this will oscillate. So when it's going upwards, so this will go up as well. And you can imagine that. So now this link on the other end will be like this, this, this side, right? So basically link four can oscillate between these angles. So this is, this is the angle link four can cover, right? So link three is basically oscillating up and down. So which slides on output link four, producing a rocking mechanism, rocking motion. This mechanism is described as a quick return mechanism. So you see this one such a called as a quick return mechanism because crack two rotates through a large angle on the forward stroke of the link four than the return stroke. So you, you just imagine, so the forward means for example this end and if it's this end so this angle is the forward angle right so if it's going going this direction movement so it will go up 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 on 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 this one this three link will go up on this one and will stay here up and then start coming down so now to cover this distance from here to here so it will further go down and come back here so now you see again if you see now so the the mechanism is described as a quick return because crank 2 rotates through a large angle on the forward stroke so you see this angle is a large angle and this angle is a short angle right so in forward direction it is it is covering large angle and the reverse direction is covering small angle so that's why it is returning quickly on the way back such mechanism are called as a quick return mechanism that's what is happening here as well they're quite useful and i would suggest if you look at any animation or any video there are plenty of uh, quick return mechanisms are are being explained uh, available on, on open web source so you will you will see a better understanding of a quick return mechanism uh, this is also another example uh, which is again for swinging or rocking mechanism so figure 1.14 c is a four bar linkage called the crank rocker linkage so crank rocker linkage crank 2 drives rocker 4 so crank two, yeah. So one more thing is the crank is always the one component which is covering entire angle, right? So it is covering the whole angular movement. And uh, uh, so it is the, the crack two is, is linked with three and three is, is then further connected through a rocker. So this is a rocker. So you can just imagine when it's is doing complete revolution. So this link three, this point will come maximum over here and minimum over here. So for example, so similar thing will be, so this will oscillate like this basically, All right? So this, because this is a straight line, link three is rigid. So this link four, this end will oscillate equivalent to this distance. So whatever distance is like this is five meter. I'm saying just an example. 
So this will also oscillate five meter into and fro basically. Yeah, so this is also uh, uh, one of the swinging or rocking mechanism. The next is uh, figure 1.14D. Uh, so <clears throat> it shows a cam and follower. We will do this quite uh, in detail later on. So uh, in which the rotating link to this is the rotating link to called the cam. Just be considerable to see this one is like a crank, but now this point or the center is not really a center. Is it? It's, it's some offset is there. So this, for example, this is the center, but this movement is causing to move off center. So there is some eccentricity involved. Means there is there is a center of the uh, this this cam is basically is oscillating at off center distance basically. So now you can imagine if it's rotating. So when this end, this part, which is longer, comes upward. So this will this link will lift up. Right and uh, then it's at minimum. So this side is minimum. So that's why it's a minimum height. So this is this will up and this will move. This link move, will move up and down. So the cam, this is two cam, drives link three called the follower in a rocking motion. So the motion is basically a rocking and endless variety of an endless variety of cam and follower mechanisms are possible, many of which are discussed in chapter six. As I said, we will do quite a lot of this cam profile designing. So we will we will discuss it detail in chapter six. So in each case, the cam can be designed to produce an output motion with the desired characteristics. So depending on the, in the requirement, you can go really higher or lower basically. So there are, there are different designing actually. All right, so the next category is basically uh, <clears throat> repeating. So this this was swinging and the next category is reciprocating mechanism. Right, so. <clears throat> so the reciprocating mechanism, so reciprocating uh, repeating straight line motion is commonly obtained using either a pneumatic or hydraulic cylinder. A stationary screw with a traveling nut, a rectline, rectilinear drive using a reversible motor or reversing gear or a cam and a follower mechanism. A variety of typical linkage of obtaining reciprocating motion is shown in figure 1.15. So there are different mechanisms. So from name is is quite quite clear as well. So it, it, the purpose is to reciprocate uh, in a straight line. That 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 kind of mechanism. And we have some figures here now. So yeah. So these are the different. These are different examples are being discussed within this chapter. So part A, B, and C and D. I think we will just do uh, individually a couple of those ones. So the first one. Uh, in many applications, mechanisms are used to perform repetitive operation. Yeah, so the purpose in, in many applications is has to perform a continuously one work basically, such as could be pushing parts along an assembly line. So you just want to push one component on a straight line, clamping parts together while they are welded. So you have to, to clamp it to, to get it weld or folding cardboard boxes in an automated package in this machine. So this is another example where you have to push the cardboard. So for such applications, we need some reciprocating mechanism. So in a such application is often desirable to use a constant speed motor. In addition, however, we should give some consideration to the power and timing requirement. 
So we need a constant speed motor, but at the same time, the important thing is we need to consider the timing requirement and the power requirement as well, right? So what, what, what does it mean basically? Uh, we, we want to operate our cycle in such a way that the power usage is minimum when machine is idle. And also when machine is idle, the machine does not need to do a lot of work. So that's why the timing for that work is also not required to be to be uh, wasted basically. So I think the next uh, the example will be, will help you to understand. So yeah. So this is one of the uh, very good example for reciprocating mechanism. So in such a repetitive uh, operations, there is usually a part of cycle when mechanism is under load for called the advanced or working stroke. So for example, this is one of the example. So this is the crank or the part which is connected through a motor. So this is with the motor basically. So it is continuously moving basically. So then, yeah, so if it's this, this direction movement, so this is the this direction movement. So now what's happening with this one is linked with part this, this cylinder basically, uh, which is moving. This is a working stroke. So, so you just imagine when it's moving, this is continuous moving. So block initially as is, is at this position, when it's then it's been pushed in this direction. So it has covered distance from C1 to C2, which will be called as a working stroke because where you are applying some force on it to, to we are pushing it. And this force is basically from the component basically, which 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 we want to overcome. So there is some like, for example, you want to push some uh, blocks, for example. So this block force is there. So we want to push this block to this direction to C2. So that's what we, we have. And once it has done its work by reaching at C2, now it has to come back. That coming back will be called as a return stroke, right? So now you can imagine uh, when we are at C1, when we are at C1, we are basically the crank position is over here, B1. So when we are C1, so B1 is over here. And then when we have like reached C2, uh, then the crank position is basically at B2 at this point. Now you just try to understand here. Uh, so from here to this end, this is called as a alpha. So B1 to B2. So B1, when the crank is at B1, we are at position this one. So and when it reaches at this particular point C2, crank is B2. So the crank has covered a, an angle of alpha to move the component from C1 to C2. So we moved this, the, we, we have done the work by moving from C1 to C2 by covering an angle on a crank with alpha. But when on the way back now after the work is being done, so we have to come back from B2 to B1 and during that the angle is covered beta. So now it is quite visible. The alpha is much larger. So you see from alpha is going all the way to here and beta is relatively smaller angle. So it's, it's like this one. So now, now, now I, th I hope you have understood. So I'll just go through again. In such repetitive operation, there is usually part of the cycle when the machine is under load, which is called advanced or working stroke. So this is called as a working stroke moving from C1 to C2. Uh, and, and a part of the cycle called the return stroke. So the return stroke when C2 to C1, when the mechanism is not working, but simply returning to repeat the operation. Repeat the operation means our useful work is from C1 to C2 and 
component. This has to return from C to C1. This is a return stroke, but it's not doing any work, but it has to return so that it can do the next cycle actually. For example, consider the offset slider crank linkage. So this is one of the offset slider crank linkage shown in figure 1.15a work may be. So the next is. Uh, so work may be required to overcome the load F. So this is the this is the this is the load, which is F. So you have to do some work to overcome this load. While the piston moves to the right from position C1 to position C2 from C1 to C2, but not during its return to position C1. So but when he is returning back from C2 to C1 is not doing any work. So it's more like a like loss loss of power. But you have to do that because it's a cyclic operation. Since the load may have been removed in such situation in order to keep the power requirement of the motor to a minimum and to avoid wasting valuable time. So you see there are two two things which are being considered. One, we want to do the power requirement to be minimized. And as well as we want to avoid wasting of valuable time. So there are two considerations, power and time. It is desirable to design a mechanism so that the piston moves much faster through the return stroke than it does during the advance. So again, during the advancement from C1 to C2, we are doing a useful work. We don't want to, to 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 make it faster. It has to do the way it should be done. But when we are coming back from C3 to C2 to C1, it's not doing any work. And in fact, it's, 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 it's a basically loss of power and uh, waste of time. So that's why we want to minimize this one. We want to it to return quickly back, right? So that what is, is is being done in reciprocating mechanism, especially quick return mechanism. That is a use a higher. So how you do that? The way it is. So you do alpha, which is larger this way, and beta, which is a return one. So you make it smaller. So that to use a higher proportion of the cycle time for doing work than for returning. So that's that's the major goal. You we want to use the higher portion of the cycle time for it for doing work than for the returning. Yeah, so that 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 what it, it explained actually. All right, so now. <clears throat> So we continue doing doing that. So now there is uh, one of the ratio being evaluated, which is a measure of suitability of a mechanism from the viewpoint called the advance to return ratio. So this Q is called as a advance to return ratio, right? What is that? So cycle fraction for advanced stroke. So the fraction of cycle which is required for advanced stroke and ratio with the return stroke. So within the cycle, we want higher fraction for the advanced stroke and lower fraction for the return stroke. So now you can just imagine uh, a mechanism for which the value of Q is high is more desirable. So higher the value of Q is more desirable it is for such a repetitive operation than one in which the value of Q is lower. So if they, you have two cases, one is where in one case Q is high, in one case Q is low. So the better is to have Q value higher actually. Certainly any such operations would call for a mechanism for which Q is greater than unity. So certainly we need more than one because of this mechanism with the Q greater than unity are called quick return mechanism. Yeah, so from the name, it's very clear. Quick return 
So in the return stroke, it has to quickly come back such mechanisms actually. And that's what it says. So the Q value, which is basically cycle fraction for advanced stroke divided by cycle fraction for return stroke, its, its value should be greater than one. This is the this is the requirement. All right. So now uh, a little bit further explanation on the so as shown figure for 1.15a, the first step is to determine the two crank postures. So within that, there what I explained to you. So alpha is the advance when it's moving from C1 to C2, and beta is the one where it has to come back. So first step is to determine the two crank postures, A B1. So the point A B1, so this is this is this is the line, and A B2, and this is the line. A, A B2 basically. That mark the beginning and end of the working stroke. Next, noting the direction of rotation of the crank, we determine the crank angle alpha traveled through during the advanced stroke. So alpha, which is for the advanced stroke, you identify and remaining crank angle should be beta and then the remaining one is beta. Uh, you can also explain this as a uh, return stroke. So this is the angle this, that represents the return stroke because alpha plus beta, because alpha plus beta should be equal to 360 because this is one complete revolution. So the cycle fraction for the advanced stroke is alpha over 2 pi. So alpha divided by complete 360 will be the cycle fraction for the advanced stroke. Same way we find this cycle fraction for return stroke, which is basically beta, which is this angle divided by complete one cycle, two pi, right? So finally substituting equation B and C into equation A. So what is equation A? I will, I will just repeat again. So we just want to find out value of Q basically. So equation A is basically this one. So cycle fraction for advanced stroke divided by cycle fraction for return stroke. And you find the independent variable and then you just plug in and find the advanced to returns ratio basically. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the way it is being determined. Alpha or beta is basically the uh, advanced to return ratio, right? Um, yeah, so th then we have another example uh, to be solved. Let's just see. All right, so de determine uh, the example is so determine a suitable set of link length for a slider crank link is such that the stroke is 2.5 inch and advanced to return ratio is 1.4. So Q value is given 1.4 and the stroke length is given which is 2.5 inches. So these two parameters are given and now you have been asked to design the, the mechanism actually. And when you say design a mechanism, basically it says uh, the link length, the length of the links you have to determine. All right, so by using these two numbers, we will work out the angles. So the value of Q, which is basically ratio of alpha plus beta, alpha over beta is given 1.40. And uh, it is also known that alpha is equal to 180 plus that particular angle basically, right? So alpha, because you know that, I will just show again. So alpha and this beta, both sum are equal to uh, 180, sorry, uh, what you call 360. So that's what we are doing. So alpha is basically some angle 180 plus 
certain portion because alpha is the one which is larger value. So it it is basically. <laughs> sorry, uh, so alpha is basically 180 plus some certain angle and beta is basically you just subtract that particular value. Because that's for the return, so alpha is always greater than beta. And uh, that's why we have this value as well, because alpha or beta ratio is 1.4. So you now work out these values from here. So our sole purpose is to find out alpha and beta. So these, these two are the one which we are interested in. Yeah. So this is just like introducing another uh, arbitrary value angle. Uh, which will be in case of alpha, you you have 180 plus some angle and in case of beta, 180 minus some angle. And uh, then you just solve these equations actually, you see. So we got uh, two unknowns and if you consider this one arbitrary value, three unknown and three equations basically, so you can work out what will be different. So you can work out alpha and beta as you see, this is logical numbers because alpha is 210, beta is 150. So what does it mean? We are covering more distance uh, during alpha movement. So in the next one, uh, the next step is basically you draw the stroke, which is 2.5 inch. This is also given, so which is horizontal. So you draw from here, from this distance, which is B1 to B2. So B1 to B2 is this one. You draw 2.5. Uh, uh, to a suitable scale. <clears throat> so label pin B. Uh, in its uh, two extreme position B1 and B2. So what you do. So this this. So you mark 2.5 inch and then you just name it as a B1 and B2. Now <clears throat> in the next step, so through point B2, draw an arbitrary line labeled X line. So you draw an arbitrary line. So this is the arbitrary line X line. You just draw this one through point B1, draw a line parallel to X line as well. So <clears throat> first you draw from here. So this is this is the X line, which is arbitrary line, and through point B1, draw a line parallel to the X line. So you draw another line which is also parallel to X line. So this this must be this one, uh, which is parallel. So this line, this line is parallel to this line basically. All right. The next step is basically. Measure the angle phi clockwise from X line. So this is the so it doesn't matter wherever you have the line, you draw 30 degree angle here. So this is 30 degree angle here, clockwise from the X line. The intersection of this line with the line parallel to X line is the ground pivot. So you have this one as a 30 degree. You draw a straight line going up like that. So this is a straight line. And wherever it intersects this line, which is basically parallel here to X line. So wherever it intersects, that will be the origin. This is the ground pivot over to, to the line of the travel of slider can be measured from the drawing, right? So the length of the ground link that is offset of eccentricity, the perpendicular distance from ground pivot O2 to the line of travel of slider can be measured from the drawing. So basically from here to this line, which is R1, can be measured experimentally. So by, by the scale, you can work out what, what this distance would be basically. And that's what he has determined. So R1, uh, so the length of ground link, the offset or eccentricity is the perpendicular distance from the point to 
or to the line of travel of cider can be measured from the drawing. So you, you just determine this one, which is R1 basically. So that's what he has determined. R1 is 2.17. And uh, the next is the length of crack R2 and coupler R3 can be determined by measurement. Yeah, so this, these things can be measured as well. For example, O2B1, O2 from here to this one, which is basically, uh, so O2 to B1. So this is, this distance is basically R3 plus this R2. So this is R2 from here to here, and this is R3. So total distance, we, we can measure 4.33 and uh, which will be sum of R2 and R3 basically. And then O2 to B2 so from here to here, which is also basically uh, R2, sorry, uh, yeah. So now he's using one of the, the triangular method, uh, but this length you can measure directly from, from here and it should be equal to R3 minus R2 which is 2.5 inch, so 2.5 inch is being measured experimentally, basically. Yeah. And uh, that is, so R2 now, because we know these two equations and two unknown, so you can solve simultaneously R3, R2, you can find out R2 and R3, basically. Yeah, so this particularly R3 minus R2, you can just imagine because it has to, to because R3, you know, this is the, this is the point where you have R2 being added up. So this, this is the, this is the maximum point, maximum length from here to here. But when it, it is at this point, so basically that what we will have uh the the r2 being subtracted so r2 is the crack basically so this is r2 is the crack basically yeah so you can simultaneously solve these equations to find r3 r2 basically which is also being shown here uh in in in, in, in mathematically as well, analytically as well. Or you can just measure experimentally. For example, from these two equations, you can work out. That's it then. Thank you very much.